Good morning and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be your host for today's session. This is the first in our series of Engaging Caregivers, a program for healthcare workers. And today we're going to be talking about defining caregivers and recognizing their experience. And today we have with us as our presenters, Lucy Barilux and Dr. Elliot Montgomery Scar. So let me tell you just a brief bit about them before we get started. Lucy Barilak has a master's degree in social work from McGill University. She is presently working as a consultant for a health network in Montreal, Canada. She has been involved in various research projects and has published numerous articles related to caregiving issues. She has lectured at several universities and colleges on innovative approaches to caregiving and presents annually at international and national conferences. Lucy is also a consultant for private industry in the United States, including her work with the WellMed Charitable Foundation and clinics in Texas. She would also like you to know that she was a caregiver for her mother for about 10 years. Dr. Elliot Grammy Sklar is an associate professor of health science at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. He has worked as an educator, researcher, and leader of community-based health programs in the United States and Canada for over 15 years. He has a doctorate degree in public health and teaches disease outbreak and investigation, which has been central to the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the pandemic began, he helped to facilitate over 75 sessions to support caregivers during this time for the WellMed Charitable Foundation, the American Public Health Association, and for senior living communities across the country. Welcome, Lucy and Elliot. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're gonna begin by just sharing some learning objectives that we have attached to today's program. We're going to describe family caregivers and their challenges. We're also going to discuss the role of family caregivers in care planning. We'll review physical and mental health issues among caregivers, including addiction. And finally, we'll identify some self-care resources. If anyone has questions as our program goes, please do feel free to um, uh, post in the chat box. We'll also pause uh, for uh, questions and, and audience participation. And as I mentioned, certificates of attendance for this program are available. The information at the bottom of the screen includes uh, the email address um, to obtain those certificates. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I wanna say that frontline health workers are the backbone of effective health system. You know, they're often based in community and come from the community uh, they serve. They play a big role in providing services, solutions, referrals, and prevention to families, individuals, caregivers, and care receivers. So I just want to review how have healthcare workers responded to the pandemic. By all accounts, healthcare workers have responded exceedingly well. They are showing up, they put in long hours and have adapted to their new reality. They have continued to demonstrate strong compassion and brave front despite the fears that they may harbor in order to protect themselves and their families and those they serve. They certainly are heroes, I have to say that, and we thank them every day. So I wanna thank all of you every single day. Um, <clears throat> on a personal level, both Elliot and I want to thank you personally for all that you do. During the pandemic, the role of caregivers gained new attention and their role became even more crucial. We know, however, that the role of healthcare workers is focused on patient-centered and patient-centered outcomes. Often little focus is paid to the role of caregivers in supporting these patient-centered outcomes. And this is a focus of our um, motivation in creating these series to support healthcare workers to have a better understanding and um, a response to how to support caregivers in their caregiving journey. Thank you. Let me just advance, there we go. Um, so caregiving in the U.S. is a national study in the United States, obviously, that is conducted and coordinated by the National Alliance for Caregiving and AARP. The 2020 study is the most recent one available that has been published. 
and it reveals an increase in the number of family caregivers in the United States. Um, the number has actually gone up by nine and a half million from 2015 through 2020. And I imagine that when the next publication comes out, we'll see an even greater increase because of COVID. Family caregivers now encompass more than one in five Americans. The study also revealed that family caregivers are in worse health compared to when they initiated the study in 2015, um, five years prior. As the demand for caregiving rises with an aging population, there is an opportunity for both the public and the private sectors to work together to develop solutions to support family caregivers and those under their care. What we have also found in these um, studies, you know, in addition to um, poor health, is that there has been financial impact, um, more challenge in coordinating care, and I'm sure that that has increased um, also as a consequence of the pandemic. Um, we have also learned uh, about different experiences that caregivers are going through right now. The majority of caregivers are baby boomers, though more and more younger adults are becoming caregivers. In fact, there's some new research coming out now about millennial caregivers, um, which is a very interesting new focus of uh, caregiving research. But in this uh, report, what was found was that 61% of caregivers are women and 39% of men. We also know that there are certainly financial inequities for caregivers. 61% of them um, work and 45% have had at least one financial impact, as I mentioned, as a result of their caregiving role. For example, they may be passed up for a promotion at work um, or, you know, needing to take extensive time off or medical leave. More than a quarter of family caregivers report that they have difficulty coordinating care. And we also know about health inequities among diverse caregiver populations, which we'll talk about later in our series this month. There are even inequities among men and women, which are also themes that we'll be focusing upon in our last of this series. So in addition to this, half of family caregivers are providing care for those 50 and older, and they indicate that they had no choice in the matter. As you can imagine, almost 40% of these caregivers report high emotional stress, and about 20% of them report both physical and financial strain. I think for me, what is perhaps most concerning is that about six of 10 family caregivers providing care for someone 50 or older indicate that they're providing nursing or medical care. And nearly half of those family caregivers indicated that they had no training in doing so. And that certainly is concerning for me as a professor of, of health science, but I think also for our care recipients. Uh, think about whether or not you want to be receiving care from someone who has received no training. It's a big one. So let me share this video and I hope that it will work. I did practice prior to today to make sure. Here we go. Can hear. No, no sound. So, all right. I will share the link after our session today. My apologies. I practiced, I even recorded it and it worked on my end. So I am sorry, it is a great video. Um, Lucy, do you wanna sort of encapsulate what it is that you were sharing here? Well, I was sharing that, you know, I was a caregiver as, um, as um, Glenda had said, I was a caregiver for my mother for over uh, 10 years and she suffered from many medical uh, problems as well as dementia in later years. And I'm an only child and was working full time as well. I had my own family to care for, even though I was in the field of counseling and supporting caregivers, as well as being involved in research pertaining to caregivers' well-being. Once I became a caregiver, I kind of felt lost, overwhelmed, and in denial. So many of the feelings that caregivers experience was something that I went through as well. You know, sometimes when you walk in people's shoes, you have a better understanding. 
Uh, but I guess what I want to talk about is really what you were what you were saying, Elliot, that our expectations are care of caregivers sometimes go beyond just the daily task of giving a bath or preparing meals. It's more being a nurse sometimes. And and so uh, at one point, my mother needed insulin shots and the doctor and the nurses felt that I should be trained to perform that task. Now, no one asked me if I was willing to do so or did I have the time to do so? I worked full time. They just assumed as her daughter, it was expected. I have to say, I have a tremendous fear of needles and could not imagine, um, you know, actually giving my mother a shot. Would I be doing it right? Would I be hurting her? So I just said, no, you know, I set limits and I, uh, I could see the expression on their faces. They were not pleased with me. And I know that I was being judged even though I was a very good caregiver. So I guess that's what the video kind of talks about is just to sensitize um, uh, healthcare workers to the fact that, you know, caregivers have a lot on their plate. Certainly. Um, maybe we want to open it up for some discussion or questions because I think Lucy, what you shared is very important. Sure. I don't know. Maybe other people in the who are healthcare workers are caregivers as well. And maybe you can share some of your experiences. So if you called in on your telephone, and let me see if that applies to anyone. No, everybody's on Zoom this morning. You can unmute your phone and I'll call on you by name. You can put a message in the chat box. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Well, I don't see that anyone has unmuted their phones, Lucy and Elliot, and uh, nothing in the chat box right now. All right, let me just resume my slides. Hang on. Sorry about that audio issue. Um, all right, oops. All right, there we go. Um, and, uh, oops, hold on here. I'm glad it's just not me, Elliot, that has no problems. <laughs> not not today. It's uh, <laughs> it seems to be universal. Hang on, just bear with me a moment. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on here. And like I said, I practiced and everything. I recorded the Zoom session to make sure the audio would work. I okay. wanted to, um, uh, Lucy. I wanted to know if we could just skip ahead a little bit because. The discussion that we have about caregivers being a resource partner or client is a very important one. And I think it really is a good continuation from what you were just discussing about the role of caregivers needing to sometimes assume some medical responsibility. For sure, for sure. All right, so we're, you know, we're gonna talk about uh, our caregivers, our resource, our partners, or are they clients? You know, it's been largely demonstrated through research and working in the field that without the support of family and friends, majority are mainly women, it would be impossible to maintain people with major disabilities in the community. We know that family caregivers pay an important price at all levels for their involvement in providing care. You know, most uh, models of care and service delivery regard caregivers givers as a resource. That's what we were saying. Uh, for maintaining fra frail elderly or those with any form of dementia at home. Some healthcare providers feel that caregivers should be performing these uh, duties, regardless of how many tasks are involved in the care, as well as many perceive that it is the family's duty to provide care. There's also an expectation, as Elliot said, for caregivers to develop skills knowledge in nursing, rehabilitation, treatment, and equipment maintenance. Many caregivers themselves don't see themselves as caregivers, but only as a wife, um, you know, a, a, a wife, a brother, a sister, a child, etc. You know, in order to support and make sure that caregivers care for themselves, healthcare workers are the key in providing, identifying, and advocating for caregivers' rights. Caregivers need to maintain their own well-being in order to care for their loved one. I want to talk about a, a research that we did. It was a really a big study to see how healthcare workers perceive the role of caregivers. 
It was a very interesting one. And three areas emerged, you know, some saw them really as a resource, very, very few saw them as a partner, and some were quite questioning even, are they clients? Okay, so let's just talk about this a little bit. So what is a resource? A resource provides the right resources at the right time. So think about that. Can one person really provide that at all times if you're a caregiver? A partner, partnership is an arrangement where parties agree to cooperate and advance their mutual interests being equal in decision-making. Okay, that's what a partner. And a client is a person who actually needs uh, services. So let's look again, are caregivers a resource? Is it right to expect caregivers to be a resource? In certain circumstances, and if the caregiver is able and willing to perform certain daily tasks, then yes. However, when the caregiver cannot because of their own limitations, age or unwillingness, then whose responsibility is it? I think that we all need to look into our own value system, our cultural background to answer these questions for ourselves. For example, do we expect a daughter who is capable to perform certain nursing tasks for her mother, like learning how to give insulin shots? So you heard my story, um, but it's not unique. My story is not unique at all. I mean, I know caregivers who I've been taught by physiotherapists to actually do exercises at home. Some people go back home with all kinds of, of uh, medical equipment. Um, and and, and they, I mean, I think that that's something that really needs to be looked at. No matter how much you train a person, they're not a nurse. Uh, and they're certainly not a doctor, and they're certainly not a physiotherapist. So I think this is why do I say we all have to look at it inwardly into ourselves, because, you know, our backgrounds and expectations should not be passed down to other people. We have to kind of put our thoughts away. So, um, so uh, my question to the audience, maybe you, you know, you don't feel that what I'm saying is right. What are your thoughts about caregivers as a resource? Do you see them as that? Love so to hear from you. <laughs> unmute your phone or put us a message up in the chat box and uh, we'll continue the discussion. When you talk about resources, Lucy, I'd like to know, are you talking about a resource also as they are the expert as far as the person that is being cared for. And they have information that you may not be able to get anywhere else. So is that what you mean as a resource too? Absolutely. And that's the next thing that I'm gonna talk about. about oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that was perfect, perfect. Yes, we, we, we could see them as a resource by doing tasks, right? But we should see them as one of the best resources that are, are available because they know their loved one better than any of us. Yeah, and I think, you know, we also often forget that long-term caregivers are the longest um, source of, uh, I'm sorry, the largest source of long-term care provision in this country. Um, we sometimes forget that. For sure. Okay, so um, I don't know if anybody, did anyone do it at, in the chat? Was there anything there? No, so, there's nothing there right now. All right, so we, you know, we can continue. Um, I wanna just really talk about our caregivers a partner. Let's just look at that for a minute. If so, what does partnership mean? So being equal in decision-making. So the important thing to keep in mind is that the caregiver knows their loved one better than anyone else. Right, Glenda? That's what you were. That's, that's exactly what I was asking about. Yeah. But they also have their limitations. It's important in a partnership to ask what the person needs or what they feel they can do and manage. Now, maybe if the nurse would have asked me or the doctor and not just assumed, I don't know, I might have changed my mind if I felt secure that I really could be able to do that. Negotiation is the key factor in any partnership relationship. Caregivers should always be, um, you know, involved in any decision making regarding services and any plans that a healthcare worker makes. I, that is a given. And um, then we go to, you know, the final one is, um, I think, 
Do we want to ask them? No, you skipped one over. Okay. So our, our, our caregivers are client, you know, what about that? Anyone, you know, can, can look at that. Since we know that caregivers are at a high risk for burnout, depression, physical and mental disorders, we need, um, we need to be mindful that they may need help as well. Being a client, now there's a difference between just being there for the caregiver, but being a client means that they hopefully will receive support, uh, possibly services even when needed, and uh, expectations that we associate with, with caregiving will be somewhat diminished for them. So as a client, we are also giving them permission to care for themselves. And in many organizations, when you become a client, there's a file that's open for you, okay? So then you automatically can have a caseworker working with you specifically and helping you. So our caregivers potential clients, if yes, why can anyone explain why we need to consider caregivers as potential clients? I'd love to open it up and have a nice conversation uh, with anyone who has joined us. And if you don't feel that, you know, that you should be seeing clients, you know, caregivers as a client, that's okay too. We can definitely discuss it. Same instruction, just unmute your phone and I will call on you by your name or put something in the chat box. Everybody's pretty silent today. Well, I have to tell you that when we did this research project, a lot of uh, healthcare workers really had to stop and kind of think about that. Um, because sometimes we just do things because it, there's an expectation. And so um, it's just a trigger for people to think about. I'm sure that a lot of healthcare workers think about it already. Okay, I'm not, I don't want to say that they don't, they do. And so, but it's just the way we perceive it. It's just the way we um, acknowledge it. And if you can kind of can have that understanding that caregiver, caregivers can be partners, they can be resource, and they can also be clients. I think somebody raised a hand. I see it. In yes, Yvonne. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for providing the space. And I mean, uh, my answer is pretty broad, but um, caregivers need to be um, clients because if a caregiver is not their full self, how can they really provide fullness to their loved one? So um, just thinking about like um, walking hand in hand with the caregiver in order for them to really feel strong enough to continue on their caregiving responsibilities. Thank you for that, absolutely. Uh, it looks like Becca has her hand up also. Hi, yes, thanks for sharing that. So I'm a caregiver case manager in South Dakota for our community here. And um, what that means is that, yes, the caregiver is the client and we just support them through one-on-one -on -one sessions, support groups, and a plethora of resources. So yeah, they're, they're sometimes more in need than maybe the community or family members realize. Well, I have to say you're ahead of the game in many ways. Congratulations. It's wonderful to hear that. I appreciate that. It's really good to be oh, here. So good. <laughs> Thank you. And Michelle, you had a comment? Michelle, you, did you have your hand up? Uh, your phone is muted, if that might be. I am there, so there sorry. You there you go. I, I am trying to get my life together here. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much for providing this um, to all of us. Um, again, my name is Michelle Bolden. I am with Outreach Health Services here in San Antonio, Texas. I was a field supervisor um, for four and a half years. And then about mm, four, almost four years ago, um, I took over the position um, as business development liaison. So I have two perspectives here. Like, 
I guess I, I'm just going to be reiterating what the other two women had already said. Um, caregivers are definitely a client, or, and if they're not, and and you're you know, and they're with your agency, they definitely should be. Um, as a caregiver, I cared for my mother, you know, you know, all the way into her absolute last day, and so my passion is you know is in home health care. I know the importance of keeping you know and providing excellent care but i think a lot of times you know we forget the worth and and the fact that the caregivers are are the, are the rock the core you know if and just like you know the other woman said earlier if they're not well if they're not okay then how can they provide you know you know the you know they're all you know to that to that client. Not only that, but they spend, I mean, I, you know, it's been my experience and things that I've seen and, and that I know on a personal level, you know, those caregivers are the ones that spend the most time with those clients. And it's easy to take on, you know, you know, all of the things that the client is going through, you know, that's additional, you know, stress, that's additional worries on top of the things that you deal with in your personal life. And, you know, we are doing everything we can. I mean, COVID has taught us a lot and it opened our eyes up to a lot. And it showed that, you know, we definitely need to be pouring way more resources into our caregivers in, in multiple ways. We have a clothing pantry, a food pantry, and, and, and we partner with any and everybody that we can because we realize it takes a village. I need my partners and my communities um, that, that provide, you know, clothing, utility assistance, rental assistance, because, you know, those caregivers are going through a lot themselves. Um, it doesn't help that they're, you know, you know, if they're being paid to be caregivers, the wages, you know, due to multiple reasons, state reimbursements and, and many other things. I mean, they're not making a lot. And I, I just don't think that they're recognized. And I don't think that there's enough people that, you know, understand, you know, the hardships that the caregivers go through in addition to the things that they end up absorbing, you know, because you connect with your client, you know, that client becomes your family and now their problems are your problems and their feelings are your feelings. So I just want to say all that. I know that was random and all over the place, but I am directing and, but I did not want to meet the, uh, miss this. So thank you. Thank you so much for your thoughts and feelings. I think a lot of us feel as you do. Absolutely. I echo that. A huge thanks to all of our participants for sharing what they have. Um, it certainly, as you said, Glenda, in the chat box, it, it enriches our session. But we also learn so much from hearing the different experiences of one another, and it validates a lot of what we're talking about and the experiences of our participants. Um, and I also apologize that I was jumping around with my slides in this section. It's because it really is um, kind of a cyclical conversation and these themes all work together. Um, Lucy, picking up on what you said earlier about uh, healthcare being patient-centered, this is something for me that is important as a health educator, because when you look at curricula, they really don't train medical professionals on how to uh, look at caregivers as part of uh, a care team and care planning. And also to be more mindful that caregivers have certain health issues at a higher rate than non-caregivers. For example, among chronic healthcare conditions like heart attack, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, and arthritis, they've been reported at about 45% among caregivers versus 24% among non-caregivers. So nearly twice the rate for these chronic illnesses. In addition, uh, ahead of the pandemic, about three quarters of caregivers had reported that they had not gone to the doctor as often as they should have, and more than half missed doctor appointments. So I think the key is that these statistics also present a concern for healthcare workers, as many of you have shared. If these, you know, if family um, caregivers are required to participate in delivery of care, they need to be in optimal care as well. Um, and optimal health as much as possible. So I think we all do have an obligation in supporting the well-being of caregivers, but also of ourselves. And um, that's really our, our next area here is, you know, we need to take care of ourselves. And whenever I ask this question, people are sort of taken a little bit aback because we don't think about 
what it is that we need to feel taken care of. We all know that, you know, we need to uh, look after ourselves. It's something we hear a lot of these days in, in a COVID world and a post-COVID world. But I think it's especially true for healthcare workers. Um, there is a reason that we are in the helping professions. And when we embark upon these careers whose focus it is to help others, we sometimes lose sight of the need to do that for ourselves. So I wanted to ask our participants, what do you need to feel taken care of today? And so you see now the system is working. People are raising their hands. You can unmute your phone. You can put something in the chat box. Michelle, I see your hand up. How is you? I'm just so to take it down. I'm so sorry. I'm trying to figure it out. No worries. No worries. No, not at all. Anyone else? What do you need to feel taken care of today? Sometimes it's a good question to ask caregivers as well. That's a good comment that was made by Becca. Care of their body, mind, and spirit. Wow. Somebody said, cook a healthy meal. <laughs> it's a very good question. And I think, I think what you said is extremely important. The language that we use when we speak to caregivers or to our clients in general, very basic, you know, what do you need today to feel taken care of? Like, what can I do? And it's such a simple question, but most of us are really not sure of how to answer it because we don't practice asking ourselves or thinking about what we need to feel taken care of. I think this is really true for healthcare workers and caregivers alike. You know, and given what we shared about the role of caregivers as clients and understanding that as healthcare workers, our job is sometimes to service one patient, I think we still have to keep in mind everyone, everyone's well-being in supporting that patient. If you think about that analogy, you know, when you're on an airplane and an oxygen mask descends in front of you, what do you do? Well, we all know if you've been on an airplane that the first rule is to put the oxygen mask on yourself before you assist others. And only when we really first help ourselves can we more effectively help others. That's why I'm a really big believer that caring for yourself is perhaps one of the most important and often the most forgotten things that we can do as caregivers, paid or unpaid. When our needs feel taken care of, the person that we provide care for benefits as well. And there's a lot of research um, that talks about the effects of caregiving on health and well being. For example, if you're a caregiving spouse between the ages of 66 and 96, and are experiencing mental or emotional strain, you have a risk of dying that is actually 63% higher than that of people your age who are not caregivers. There's a combination of loss, prolonged stress, the physical demands of caregiving, and biological vulnerabilities that come with age that place people at more significant risk for health problems as well as earlier death. Older caregivers are not the only ones who put their health and well-being at risk. If you're a baby boomer who has assumed the role of caring for an aging parent while simultaneously juggling work, raising children, you face increased risk for depression, chronic illness, and also a possible decline in quality of life. Now, despite these risks, family caregivers of any age are more likely than non-caregivers to um, practice preventative healthcare and self-care behavior. Regardless of age, sex, race, or ethnicity, caregivers report problems attending to their own health and well-being while managing caregiving responsibilities. Makes sense, there's only so many hours in a day. Most commonly, caregivers report sleep deprivation, poor eating habits, failure to exercise, failure to stay in bed when they're sick, and also postponement or failure to make medical appointments for themselves, as I mentioned earlier. That's been a really big one, especially with the pandemic. Caregivers are also more likely to have chronic illnesses, namely high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and a tendency to be overweight. Studies also show that an estimated 46 to 59% of caregivers suffer from some level of clinical depression. So I think it's very important. We need to ask family caregivers, what do you need to feel taken care of today? How are you feeling today? 
and please remind them of the importance of self-care. You know, we all have a responsibility in taking care of ourselves. And this I think applies for healthcare workers and for family caregivers. And many times attitudes and beliefs form personal barriers that stand in the way of caring for ourselves. We might not be accustomed to that in the culture in which we were raised, for example. Not taking care of yourself might be a lifelong pattern. And as I said earlier, there's a reason why many healthcare workers go into the helping professions. So, you know, I, I ask our healthcare workers who are participating to sort of take pause and to think if some of this might sound familiar. Um, there are ways certainly of breaking old patterns and overcoming obstacles. It's not easy, but it certainly is important. It can be done regardless of age or situation. And I think the first task is removing those personal barriers to self-care. Um, for example, do you think that it's selfish to put your needs first? Is it frightening to think of your own needs? And what is that fear all about? Do you have trouble asking for what you need? Many of us do. Do you feel inadequate if you ask for help? Or do you do too much as a result of not thinking about those things? I think sometimes caregivers have misconceptions that also increase their stress and get in the way of good self-care. Because we base our behavior on our thoughts and beliefs, attitudes and misconceptions like those that I've discussed can cause paid and unpaid caregivers to continually attempt to do what cannot be done, to control what cannot be controlled. And the result is feeling sometimes frustrated, failure, and also an inclination to ignore our own needs. So I just can't emphasize it enough. It's so important to take pause and to think, what do you need? And to encourage that practice among the caregivers with whom you're working to. There are some practices that might be helpful. First and most important is if you haven't been to your doctor for your regular checkup, be sure to do that. We know that getting proper rest and nutrition is so important. Exercising, even if it's just a few minutes at a time. Taking time off without feeling guilty. So many people fail to take their time off from work and it's, it's really important to disconnect. I think it's also important, especially now as we're moving into the endemic phase of our COVID-19 um, experience, that we try to get back to things that we enjoy. Um, nurturing activities, things on our own, could be reading a book or taking a warm bath, but it could also be spending time with others and being out and feeling a sense of, of uh, a social life that we may not have enjoyed for some time. There are a lot of things to do, but it's very important to set goals, to identify and acknowledge your feelings, to seek support if you need it, um, like speaking with a counselor um, and, and friends as well. Lots of information there, um, but you know, self-care, it's just, I'm all about self-care. I think it's the most important thing. And uh, it's also a very good barometer of our overall health. You know, I'm, I'm often reminded when I see my doctor, if you can exercise, that's a really good sign, you know, and most people uh, unfortunately don't, don't, don't get to do that as much as we should. Thank you for that, Elliot. Yes, it's really important to take care of ourselves and to make sure that caregivers take care of themselves as well. I do want to talk about the impact of caregiving on uh, caregivers' mental and emotional health. You know, psychological health of family caregivers is negatively affected by providing care. We know that. Higher levels of stress, anxiety, depression, and other mental health effects are common among family members who care for an older relative or friend. You know, um, studies, there are high levels of depression. So studies consistently report higher levels of depression, symptoms, and mental health problems among caregivers than among their non-caregiving peers, okay? Estimates show that between 40 to 70% of caregivers have clinically significant symptoms of depression with approximately one quarter to one half of those caregivers meeting the um, diagnostic criteria for major depression. 
Uh, both caregiver depression and perceived burden increases as the caregiver's uh, receiver's functional status decline. Thus, higher levels of clinical depressions are attributed to people caring for individuals with dementia. Studies show that 30 to 40% of dementia caregivers suffer from depression and emotional stress. So it, it goes along really a lot with what we're saying. The longer you're a caregiver, um, you're likely to feel a lot of what of these emotional difficulties. Depression and anxiety disorders found in caregivers persist and can even worsen after placement of a patient in a nursing home. Many caregivers who institutionalize their relatives report depressive symptoms of anxiety to be as high as it was when the care was in the home. And that's why we feel so strongly that many times cases are closed just because they go into long-term care. But a lot of these caregivers are suffering a lot of these anxieties and should be seen and followed. And that's why it's even more important to see them as a client. So even once their loved one is in placement, they're still dealing with a lot of emotions. You know, depressed caregivers are more likely to have um, coexisting anxiety disorders, substance abuse, uh, dependence on chronic and, and chronic diseases. Depression is also one of the most uh, common conditions associated with suicide attempts. So we have to keep all that in mind. You know, so again, caregivers suffer from high levels of stress and frustration. Caregivers have higher levels of stress than non-caregivers. They also describe feeling frustrated, angry, uh, drained, guilty, or helpless as a result of providing care. Some 16% of caregivers feel emotionally strained and 26% say that taking care of a loved one is hard on them emotionally. An additional 13% of caregivers feel frustrated with the lack of progress made with, the, with their loved ones. You know, they're seeing that decline and it's very hard to deal with. Caregiving can also result in feeling a loss of self-identity, lower levels of self-esteem, constant worry, a feeling of uncertainty. Caregivers have less self-acceptance and feel less effective and less in control of their lives than non-caregivers. We know that caregivers isolate themselves. So as health workers, we have to really make sure that they don't go in that direction. More than one fifth, 22% of caregivers are exhausted when they go to bed at night and many feel they cannot handle all their caregiving responsibilities. Caregivers who experience chronic stress may be at a greater risk for cognitive decline, believe it or not, including loss of short-term memory and attention and verbal IQ. It does affect you. All these emotional feelings affects your well-being. So I do want to talk a little bit about the health consequences for women caregivers. Research shows that female caregivers who, compr uh, who uh, comprise about two thirds of unpaid caregivers fare worse than their male counterparts, interestingly enough, reporting higher levels of depression and anxiety symptoms and lower level of subjective well being, life satisfaction, and physical health than male caregivers. According to one study, there is a dramatic increase in risk of mental health consequences among women who provide 36 or more hours per week of care to a spouse or a partner. In a national survey on caregiver health, more than one in five, that's 21% of women surveyed had, uh, had no mammogram done, you know, so they really don't take care of their health. Stressful caregiving situations may lead to harmful behavior. As a response to increased stress, caregivers are shown to have increased alcohol and other substance use. Several studies have shown that caregivers use uh, prescription and over-the-counter uh, uh, drugs more than non-caregivers. For example, a lot of pain pills, sleep, sleeping pills. So family caregivers at a greater risk for higher levels of hostility, 
um, and 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 just just you know, of abuse, I have to say. So partners and spousal caregivers who are at risk of clinical depression and are caring for someone a significant cognitive impairment or physical care need more likely to they're more likely to engage in harmful behaviors towards their loved one. So you know. We are talking about elder abuse now. I'm not saying that caregivers abuse their loved ones, but there are at risk. And what we are going to be doing in our second series, I hope you all join us because we are going to be talking a little bit about um, elder abuse as well. Are there any questions? Because I've said an awful lot and maybe take a bit of a breather <laughs> and see, does anybody want to make a comment? Have you noticed yourself in your practice? Um, that maybe caregivers are showing some of the signs that we, are being, that we have been uh, talking to you about from research. And there were a few comments earlier there in the chat box, which I'm, I'm sure y'all have seen. Um, but the, I think the one that concerns me, and I think it's probably pretty common, is Michelle's, where she said, sadly, I don't know since I don't make time for myself. Um, I think that that is pretty common among caregivers. and, and either paid or unpaid, they definitely have that uh, situation there. Would y'all have any advice as first steps for her? Well, I think it all goes back to what Elliot was saying. You know, there's many reasons why the feelings that emerge. I, and I, if you remember, I said that when, even though I was a quote professional in the field, when I became a caregiver, all these feelings emerged all of a sudden, that guilt, uh, was I doing enough for my mom? Uh, I was burdened. I was irritable. Um, I had work. I had my kids. I think the most important thing is first and foremost to acknowledge your feelings. If you're feeling a certain way, there's a reason for it. And one of the best things to do, just because we're healthcare workers, doesn't mean we should not get help when we need it. It's extremely important to be able to do that, to acknowledge it, and go and get the support that you need. It helped me, I have to tell you, I had to do that. And it brought me to a point of being able to prioritize my caregiving role. And I think Ellie, I'm sure that you have a lot to say about that where it comes to what do we do for ourselves besides you know, exercising, you talked about exercising, you have to have a well-balanced life and we have to do that for ourselves. I agree. Um, and, you know, Glenda, you asked what would be a good first step. I think it's that question that I had asked, what do you need to feel taken care of? And we often forget that. And, and it, if you think about it, healthcare workers, we go into helping professions for a reason. Our, our drive, our passion is to help others. And when we make a practice of that, it, it, it's only natural that sometimes we forget that we have to take care of ourselves too. So I think just taking that moment, that reflection, recognizing that we have needs as well, and thinking about what we might need just today to feel taken care of. It could be something really small. And you have to have the courage to do that. I think somebody put that on the chat. The first step is acknowledging I can't do this alone. We're not superheroes people just because we're in the healthcare profession we're not superheroes we're allowed to feel certain ways i'm just looking at the time and i just want to quickly go through i think one of the things is addiction and mental health family caregivers are also at increased risk for excessive use of alcohol tobacco other drugs caregiving can be as i said emotional roller coaster on the other hand Caring for a family member demonstrates a love and commitment and can be a very rewarding personal experience. And I have to tell you, I felt that very much, even though I was overwhelmed, I was happy to care for my mom. I just had to have a balanced life so it didn't take over everything that I was doing in my life. So I want to kind of look at addiction for a minute. Uh, in the past, people often spoke about addiction as a lack of will, uh, willpower, as selfish, as um, uh, an excuse, weakness. 
It's not the case. Addiction is a disease that over time can physically change a person's brain, the way they behave and act, and even aspects of their personality. This disease can have both physical and major psychological uh, repercussions. The disease of, of addiction must be treated like you would any other disease if you had diabetes or not. Um, again, I just want to, if we could just kind of, I think it's so important, you know, substance use disorders among older persons are among the fastest growing health problem in the United States, according to um, a, a research done in 2020. Moreover, the prevalence of substance use disorders remains high in the baby boomer generation as they age in later life, with substance abuse, including drugs such as alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, prescription medications, specifically painkillers, shopping addiction, gambling, cyber addiction, and sometimes even binge eating, sex and others. So I think healthcare workers need to be vigilant and ask the right questions. If you suspect that someone, that a caregiver is displaying um, signs of addiction or even the, their loved one, it's very, very important to take note. So maybe we can go to the slide to see, you know, what does addiction look like? Um, you could be seeing all of a sudden, you know, a caregiver, lack of control, decreased socialization, they're isolating, they're withdrawn, uh, changes in their sleeping, chronic fatigue, constant illness, they're constantly sick. There's a lot of injuries going on. They might be falling, they might be drunk, there might, whatever. Physical changes also, they're huge. You know, your skin, you could have bad skin, your hair is falling out, teeth, nails memory loss, depression, aggressive behavior, apathy, and more. So that's kind of putting it in a nutshell. I know it's a lot for all of us to be um, aware of, but if you see any changes really in, in the caregiver or in their loved one, it could be a sign that they are misusing drugs. Over-the-counter ones are really bad. It's easy to get, and it's all these commercials that we have, you know, sleeping well with this, with that, we have to be careful of that. So I think at this point, if we could just open up, I'd love to hear from everybody. If you have anything to contribute or if you want to say something, we'd love to hear from you. Or if you have a question that Lucy and Elliot could answer for you, please feel free to do that. Okay. Maybe Elliot, you can talk a little bit what we're going to be discussing next uh, next week. Sure, you touched upon it a little bit, but we're going to continue some of our discussion about advocacy as it relates to elder abuse and also how to deal with difficult situations. Oftentimes, as healthcare workers, we're faced with some dilemmas as to how to handle things uh, when we enter a home environment and we're working with a caregiver and the person for whom they're providing care. So our focus is really going to be on how to handle those types of situations, how to address and identify elder abuse, and who to contact. Um, you know, that sometimes is not very clear to people is what do you do? And we'll be going step by step through that. I also wanted to mention that as always, we share our slides with all of our registered participants. So if you haven't had a chance to write down notes from today, um, we will be circulating all of our slides. And additionally, we always include resources. Um, sorry about the date here, this is wrong, but the resources are correct. We have the National, um, I'm sorry, the National Center on Caregiving Family Caregiver Alliance, um, a list of a lot of facts and tips that we've talked about today and also the Administration for Community Living, which offers caregiver support groups, respite providers, and other caregiving support services. Um, and at the top there, of course, you have the Wellmed Charitable Foundation's contact information and the email address again for receiving your certificates of attendance. Excellent. Anyone have a question or a comment? We have about four minutes, so that's plenty of time to address some questions um, that you may have about caregiving um, and in the workforce. Ah, there we go. 
<laughs> and maybe you can give us some tips that we've missed out. Oh, that's for sure. Um, okay, well, while you're thinking about that, I'm going to go ahead. Um, let's see here. I have other meetings the next few weeks, same time, however. Very interesting. Well, uh, Tanya, you can always go back and watch the podcasts of the other sessions that are coming up since it seems you have a conflict there. So go to the Caregiver Teleconnection website and um, look for these sessions and you'll be able to pick up the other ones too. That was a good question because people do have conflicts. It's just life. And, um, but we'd love to have you register if you have not and you'll be able to join us. Uh, we did have an early question uh, about a session about how to stage your loved one with dementia. And that call is this afternoon at one o'clock central time with Tam coming. So if that was what you were looking for, um, it will be on this afternoon. And then on Tuesday, March the 8th, there is a Spanish language session for caregivers. So if you are helping caregivers that uh, speak primarily Spanish, please look that one up and refer that to them. Uh, I wish my Spanish was better so I could tell you what it's about, <laughs> but I can't. But it's at 10 o'clock Central Time, Tuesday, March the 8th. And then we have a full calendar for the rest of the month. So please go to our calendar also on the Caregiver Teleconnection website and see what we are offering. And thank you all for thanking us. I love these sessions. They're so valuable. And please join us next week. And don't forget to complete our post-session survey. Um, we have a lot of information to share next week. And our last of the series will focus on cultural competence and caregiving. We're going to talk more about some of the unique nuances between male and female caregivers and also some different um, minority community and uh, underserved community issues with regards to healthcare access, equity, et cetera. And uh, just to follow up on what Elliot said, you will get a post-session survey. We would appreciate you taking a couple of minutes that it will take to complete that. If you have some uh, topics that you would like to see us present on, we'd also like to hear about that. Uh, maybe some burning question that you've had in the back of your mind as a caregiver and you would like us to cover it. Or if you've been out there and heard other presenters, not that I'm putting down Lucy or Elliot, I love working with them. Uh, but if you've heard a presenter that you would like to hear on the Caregiver Teleconnection, tell us that name also so that we can research that and see if we can arrange a session. Well, we're just about out of time. Lucy and Elliot, any final words for everybody? Well, as Rosalind Carter, uh, First Lady said, there's four kinds of people in this world, right? I, I think it's those who are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, those who will miss care, and one more that I can remember the top of my head. So at one point or another, we're all going to be caregivers, and we need to really share and be supportive to each other. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Stay well, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you next week on our next session. Thank you. Bye. Bye.